for those of you who do not know Jagat Veera Singha, he is currently the senior professor at Postgraduate Institute of Archaeology. His research interests include history, heritage management, historiography, conservation, and also history, uh, theory of archaeology. Uh, but I would like to introduce Jagat as also an artist. That is how I used to know Jagat and have known him for a very long time. So he brings with us very different perspectives in approaching history, both as an archaeologist and an artist, which is very enriching. But today he will speak as an archaeologist, especially in his role as the director for archaeology at Central Cultural Fund for Dambulla and Sigiriya sites. So welcome Jagat, welcome on board and it's lovely to have you here. Thank you, Hashini. Thank you very much. Um, I'm honored to, to do this. Thank you for uh, inviting yes. me for this. But you know, I must tell you that I thought a lot about this presentation and what kind of stuff I should be um, saying here. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a teacher who teaches to a non crowd all the time. I'm not uh, used to speaking to an unknown crowd of gathering of people. So anyway, what I thought was, I, I would like first to think, you now I'm talking about Sigiriya. You know, it's, it is, uh, it's a, it's an important archeological site, no? Uh, it's a spectacular archeological site in, in, in the world, you can say, you know? It's, it's a marvelous place, magnificent place. But we know that Sigiri. But I first like to raise the question, how do we know what we know about Sigiri? Or for that matter, how do we know what we know about the past, about Anuradhapur, all these things. But right now, we'll focus on the idea of Sigiri. Um, see, I'm speaking of the idea of Sigiri. We all have some, you know, we all have an idea, some ideas about about all these places and let's see like you know i came to know about sigiriya from uh, from books from the, at the school and from my uh, elders in my family about this uh, you know great king who was also a murderer who, who 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 killed his father something like that and also we also came to know about Sigiriya from, from, from popular culture. There were designs in my house, in my ancestral house you know, of Sigiriya, and there were window uh, decorations of Sigiriya. You know, Sigiriya was very much in the popular culture. And when I was in my youth, you know, about the time that you are thinking about expressing your first love kind of thing, there were all these songs about Sigiriya. Sigiriya was a way of expressing your love. Um, can we listen to that song to begin with? Yes, we can. We will have Lihini playing us. Yeah. Yeah, Lini. Thank you, Lini. And I also would like to show you this image. Uh, this is a scene from Tanbusu um, Duva, the first uh, color film. And this is Jivarani Kulakuru Surya and Gamini Fonseca. And the hairstyle of Jivarani Kulakuru Surya is called the Sigiriya hairstyle. It's a, I remember even my, my sister had this. So Sigiriya was, the idea of Sigiriya was highly ingrained into our thinking in, in, in various ways. So my first uh, point is, let's get into Sigiriya with this various stories, various, um, so many people claim Sigiriya in, in many different ways. So like, um, like any, <clears throat> any idea of the past, the idea of Sigiriya 
is a modern idea. What I mean is, you know, it is a modern idea constructed by, by historians, archaeologists, and the popular culture. And it's an idea that, that, that is evolving, changing. So first, uh, first point, when thinking about history, which I usually tell my students, or even when I do archaeology, ideas on past events and the agents from the past or of the past that caused such events can be fixed to a single truth claim. That's, that is what I believe. You cannot uh, fix the past to a single, single voice, single interpretation or single truth claim. There are always, I mean, we know that even what is happening right now, if you read three different papers, three different national newspapers, depending on their partisan politics, you will hear three different stories. So even, even the contemporary incidents have more than one, one reading, one story. So the idea of secret is also the same. You cannot fix it, it to uh, one static, unchanging uh, truth claim. Uh, <clears throat> And, and then, in that case, having said that, let's see what are the kinds of uh, pasts that, that Sigiriya has. In one hand, you have, an, an, you have this ancient chronicle of, of the 5th or 6th century, um, uh, which is called Mahavamsa. And you have a, a, sto a story of Sigiriya there. And then, there are these people called archaeologists who are working with historians or developing history ideas of the past that they have created several different stories. Um, I think it's high time to look at some images of the of the Sigiriya. Yeah? And for that, I'll share my screen with you. As my uh, title of my, my presentation speaks, Sigiriya needs many stories. That's what I'm going to talk. No? So Sigiriya has a historical past and, an, and also an archaeological past that is constructed by archaeological investigations. No, archaeological investigations that Sigiriya has been going since late, late 19th century till yesterday light. And it's, you know, it is in this ancient forest cover, you know, it, it, you know, there are more than 22 ancient villages in this, uh, villages in this, in this forest cover. And these villages have different stories about Sigri, exactly what we, the archeologists or the, uh, the, the privileged historians want to believe. Uh, Professor Gananatha Obeseker did this marvelous study on these, uh, these stories about uh, Sigri. Uh, Anyone interested in which we will be talking about, can find this in, in, in this, uh, under this title. It, it, it is a book uh, edited by HLC and Evrath. I'll come to these things later, or I can put them in, in, in the chat box. So as you no, know, there had been a huge uh, uh, palace on top of this, this rock, no? And, this is the famous uh, pleasure gardens or water gardens of Sigiriya. And as you know that that orange strip is called, this orange strip is called the mirror wall. This is the lion staircase. When archaeologists would call this lion staircase, some people do not agree with this idea. And then these boulder gardens. Yeah, the middle wall. <laughs> so let's 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 try to uh, uh, understand or 
So uh, I'd like to tell you the history of Sigiri as such. You know, it's <clears throat> as, as recorded in the Mahavamsa. The story is recorded in Mahavamsa. In this case, the latter part of the chronicle refers to as Chulavamsa, because Mahavamsa has uh, the original Mahavamsa and, and the second part, which was known as Chulavamsa. It is in, in this part, the second part of Mahavamsa that uh, Sigiri has mentioned. The story unfolded in the last part of the 5th century during the reign of King Datusena, who ruled from the ancient capital, of, uh, capital at Anuradhapura. Then uh, a palace coup by Prince Kasyapa, the king's son by a non-royal consort. It's very interesting. It's mentioned in the Mahavamsa, in the ancient chronicle. And this, this Kasyapa's mother being a non-royal consort has opened to various interpretations. So Kashyap led to the seizure ma'am and launched this coup, seizure of the throne at the subsequent execution of Dalsena. So he is a parricidal king, you know. And the fleeing of Mughalana, his 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 half brother, the real heir to the throne, Kashyap's half brother, and the rightful heir to the throne, and he it says he goes to India and people just believe that he went to South India. And the story ends with Kasyapa's suicide on the battlefield after 18 years. And then his last rites were performed by his brother, who was also his opponent. And so after Kasyapa's death, Sigiriya palace and the royal quarters were abandoned. And a and the monastery period begins here. I must tell you, before Kashyapa came here, came to Sigiriya and built his, his, his palace and the water gardens, Sigiriya was a monastic settlement before that. So by the time Kashyapa came to Sigiriya, it was already, there were built structures. So, <clears throat> so the early historical period, that, uh, there's an early historical period at Sigiriya that begins around 3rd century BC uh, with the establish, establishment of a Buddhist monastic settlement on the western and northern slopes of the, of the hill. So there was a monastic settlement, Kashyapa comes and his period ends and then another monastic settle, period begins with the patronage of the of, of, of of Mughalan, or Mughalan. And during the post Kashyapan phases, Sigiriya became a popular pilgrimage site that drew people from all over the country. And they came to, to see, and you know, now there is a monastic site there. And then these people came, maybe for religious purposes, but they were also motivated by the wonder of, of the Sigiriya ruins by that time, by the mirror wall, as you can see on the, uh, on the slide. This is called the mirror wall because it's, it, it has been highly polished and it is still polished. It has, uh, when we come to talk about material, materials and techniques of Sigiriya uh, paintings and, and, and plastering, we'll, we'll talk about it. You know, it's a very uh, unique plastering uh, technique that has, that is also found, uh, found in Raja, places like Rajasthan, not totally, you know, it's part of the whole, whole region. It looks like people have been motivated by a desire to see the Kasyapa period murals, the palace on the summit, the wonderful or wondrous lion staircase and other architectural features. And, and we know that something fantastic happened then and uh, there when these people came i want you to okay look at this slide can you see this if you notice this black line here but you see there had been a huge mural along in this whole area of the western face of the rock so there have been a huge mural and you can still right now we have in this depression here 
but it has been one of a gigantic outdoor mural here. So people would come and they would see I mean, those days, you know, so now in the post class Japan period, there have been more fragments of, of, of these murals. And these murals were the oops, were were these, these apteras. These are called apteras. Um, and, and they come and see these, these apteras and they, they are so moved by by the by these by these apsaras, these, these murals, and they leave their poetic impressions on the mirror wall. And they are called, they are famously known as Sikri Graffiti. Uh, Professor General Paranitana wrote this monumental two volumes on, on the graffiti, on these, uh, or the poetic inscriptions left by those people um, on the mirror wall. And we also have found a movable, Sonia's like uh, figurines of that looks like the uh, that, that 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 looks that they have been imitating the art of of Sigria. The apsaras have been casted on on terracotta, and they were they were probably Sonia's. So that the Sigria has been a tourist site since since that time. So these uh, these this is one of the inscriptions. Uh, taken it from Paranitana Sigri Graffiti, number 605. And these, uh, these uh, inscriptions have been dated to 6th century to AD to 14th centuries. So, so you see, Sigiriya from, from very early times has been inspiring imagination of the Lankan popular thinking, which it is still doing. And so that is the, that's, and then, okay, something else happens. And then it's again abandoned, gets abandoned for a while, and then it becomes an, uh, uh, a military outpost for the Candian uh, kings. Then we, it, it get, disappears from, it doesn't disappear, but you know, we forget it. There are no mention, and then, in the 19th century, colonial adventurous officers, military officers, find this place. You know, begins to record this place again. The first person to do that was in 1980, sorry, 1830s. The British military officer Jonathan Forbes. See, this is this image is from Jonathan Forbes. You know, they all looked at Seagull, yeah, from its southern side. Across the Sigiriya Vava or the Sigiriya tank, they they all um, and what you see on on this side is a stamp. You know, this is the Sigiriya that was 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 in their mind in the in the early twentieth century in their in these explorers, in these pe uh, those people who visited Sigiriya. But but now Sigiriya is different. Now we look at Sigiriya from this side. This is the work of archaeologists and historians. This is the western side of Sigiriya. We think of Sigiriya from its western side. Early on, at the early 20th century, they thought of Sigiriya. They imagined Sigiriya from its southern side. It's like, like Sigiriya, like uh, this one, this, this wonderful thing emerging out of nature. But with Archaeologists and like people like us, Sigiriya is this now. It is of its pleasure garden. But in this discussion, I would like to bring you this kind of Sigiriya. Sigiriya, here we are looking at Sigiriya from another tank, which is in the village of Talkote. From Talkote, you are looking at uh, from the band of Talkote tank, you're looking at Sigiri and you're seeing um, Tidrangala, it's a, a, a temple, Buddhist temple, a monastic site, and Sigiri. So let's get into the, the stories of Sigiri. All right, so according to Par Paranitana, you know, Paranitana did this wonderful, uh, pretty 
engaging essay on the meaning of the Apsaras. Many archaeologists, art historians do not agree with, agree with his uh, final interpretation as these uh, Apsaras, as Vidyulata and Megalata, as the daughters of the celestial god Quera. But, but naming these images with such a specific, uh, bringing in such specificity to these images may be, may be considered or seen a, as an over interpretation. But you know what? What, what is so interesting about Paranavitana's Paranavitana, Paranavitana methodology or the art historical method, try to understand or interpret these images. Like H.C.P. Bell, the first uh, commissioner of archaeology, he said, no, these are uh, portraits of, of court ladies, which is fine. I'm sure Seneca Bandarnak has also argued, mentioned this. Whoever painted this, this, this images of these, these women uh, floating on clouds, the royal, the court ladies must have played a role, you know, they must be imitating, getting cues, getting jewel, you know, designs, jewelries, and all these things of, 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 of the court ladies. But to think of these things as uh, portraits of court ladies is rather, well, one can question it. Um, but, but, but something interesting is, is here. HCP Bell was actually basing his interpretation on one important aspect, feature, one, one important features of, of this mural. That is, or, um, at that time there were 22, I think we still have about 22 uh, female figures painted. What is important is that each female figure is a personality. They don't look alike. Just think of you going to a place like Dambulla or to Tiwanki Image House. You can see that you know the murals of Dambulla are painted from one template. They are not individualized. They all look alike. All the Rahatans images of, of monks, they will look, they look alike. But here, each one is an individual female figure with a specific personality. So he was actually basing his uh, interpretation or identification of this, these Apsaras on that particular feature of, a unique feature of Sigiriya, yeah, Sigiriya murals. But that is only naming, uh, he was naming, uh, identify, giving, endowing an identification to these images. Then Kumara Swami gave another interpretation. He is the one who uh, called these things Apsaras. They are Apsaras because they are floating on clouds. It's a, it's a long tradition, beginning that is that can that can go as far as to to Iranian plateau, in all that part. You know, women floating on clouds as Apsaras. But Paranavitana had a different way approach. He did not try to name the figure in these figures right away. Instead, he did, he tried to understand the politics of the historical agent behind this. That is Kashyapa's politics. You know, let me tell you something. Something I believe. Sigiriya is a site of difference. I'll, I'll come to this idea. Sigiriya is a site of difference. Difference. It's it, as Paranitan has. You know, pretty uh, powerfully argued, Sigri present a break or a pause in the idea of, of kingship in, in Sri Lanka or in, in, in the ancient history of Sri Lanka. Yeah, it's a, it's a big period because, you know, because Kashyap killed his father, who was an ardent supporter of the Anuradhapura. He was much detested, was, you know, was rejected by the, by the monks. So for him to legitimize his 
power, he's, he looked somewhere else to legitimize his, his, his authority to be the king. So he presented himself as a Parvata Raja or, or, or a divine, a king with some divine uh, affiliations. In my own work, I have argued at Sigiriya, you know, you, you find water in, 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 in many different ways. See, you have this huge Sigiriya Vava here, and there is there are ponds that actually there's a big pond up there, and it, these are all water gardens, you know, these are all ponds here, you know. There is, uh, in, along this meandering path, there's, there's running water, and there are fountains. They're still working. You know, they're still after monsoon rain, these fountains still work. So when you go into Sigiriya, you feel like this water is coming from the rock, while it is actually not. But it gives that illusion that it is coming from the rock, and, and who is living on the rock? It's Kashyapa. So, there is this huge mural uh, overlooking the, uh, the water gardens, and there's this shiny wall, and there's this palace on the top. You know, it's bringing a certain kind of narrative specificity to the entire space, entire area here. Entire, it changes the, the ambience of the site. No, so Kashyapa was presenting himself as, as something with divine affiliations. In my work, work I have asked, is presenting as if he is making water. If all the kings before him did collect water, I'm giving you water kind of thing. You know, that is not a crazy idea of it. That's not a new idea for Kashyapa. Very soon, in that period, you'll find the Pallava king. They would be doing the same thing that they are becoming the people who the, the agent who brings the Ganga river Ganga from heaven from heaven to the to the earth they would be the intermediaries between the gods in heaven and the people so they bring water so going back to Paranikana's art historical methodology is he did not try to name the Apsaras like this or but he just first tried to understand the historical agent and his politics and then went to name the name the murals so this is why i said like you know paranatana's art historical method is very very unique for that time and it is about the same time this famous archaeologist philosopher rg collingwood comes out with the same idea in his very famous book one of his famous book uh, the idea of history this is also his theory. If you want to crack a historical event, you better know the politics of the historical agent, or if you want to know why Julius Caesar crossed the, the review at Rubicon, you should know his Republican politics. This is exactly what I'm, I'm Paranitana was not influenced by R.G. Collingwood. He doesn't give reference, but you know, he did that in 1940s, he did the same time. So, uh, so Parnitana tells you that uh, gives this uh, very interesting art historical idea. But then that is one historical past that Parnitana created in 1950s. No? But then in by 1970s, Parnitana has another really difficult history for, for Seigiriya in the book called The uh, Story of Seigiri, where he has this, this Christian influence on Mughalan and this and that is a very complicated story. And he's reading these, uh, what we call the interlinear uh, inscriptions. You know, he's uh, referring to uh, a, a strong inscription in Ramakale, but that is uh, many historians and archeologists do not give any, any scholarly credit to those, those writings anymore. So, but I'll come to that point later on as an archaeologist, because this is a, it's, a, it's, it's another story. It has two stories for, and then uh, Bandaranaika people like Senator Bandaranaika, my my teacher, don't agree with this. They would see it as an over interpretation, but he also believes that you know Sigiriya is mostly a construction of thing built by, by Kashyapa. But then, 
if you look read Raja De Silva, Dr. Raja De Silva, who was a commissioner of archaeology, he has published a book called Sigiri Painting. That book he argues a very different story. According to him, Sigiri Aisa was never Kashyapas, but it was a place for Godastara. For him, these are all Godastara. But that also, uh, like most archaeologists or art historians, do not subscribe to that idea very much, that theory very much about Sigiri, but it's told another historical past for Sigiri. See, for Sigiri, you already have two historical past. One historical past that is very much linked to Mahavamsa. One historical past is written by, uh, by an archaeologist who was a former commissioner of archaeology who claims a different story. I'm not going to give you my judgment on what I think about it. That's not important. But I'm trying to convey to you is, you know, Every story is so convincing if you read it on its own own way. This is this is something about about history, like you know, or archaeology. If you read one author and you know follow him, you know he's very convincing. Then you read uh, um, uh, Paranetan, he's also very convincing. Then you read Seneca Bandaranaika, he would I mean, he would also very convincing. And you read me, well, I'm not as as good as them, but whoever you know, I might also find very convincing to you but but it, it goes to that my my initial argument no the past is not static it is also changing with time with new discoveries new ideas new theories new ways of seeing the past past is not uh, one voice or one truth okay then so we have historical past as given in mahavamsa and then you have an archaeological past given by Paranitana and Bandaranaka and Raja de Silva. While they do not totally agree with each other, um, they're not agreeing with each other totally, except Bandaranaka and uh, Paranitana, they are uh, more or less agree with that, with the Mahavamsa story. Then you have a, another story about, another story about Sigiriya. That's the story of Sigiriya said by, by by the people in these villages, my own work has come, you know, for them, Sigiriya, there have been kings in Sigiriya before Kashyapa. This, you know, the villagers of Sigiriya has told me this, this is what they believe. And for them, the history of Sigiriya begins with Mahasen, not Kashyapa. And they also know, they will say, okay, you guys, Okay, you, sir, uh, learned uh, professors, your history is privileged. But this is what we believe. And then, as I told you, you know, Professor Garnatha Obesekar did this uh, wonderful essay um, called The Myth of the Human Sacrifice, History, Story, and Debate in Buddhist Chronicles. He, he does this research around Sigiriya, around the idea of Sigiriya, around the story of Sigiri as told by the people in these villages. I mean, it's a crazy story. According to them, Kashyapa is a, is it Kashyapa? Yes, Kashyapa is a Tamil, according to some of them. And remember, I highlighted the fact about the Kashyapa's mother is a non-royal consort. That is, you know, it's a very good question. Why did Kashyapa come to Sigiri? Mahavamsa says he came to, you know, to protect himself, to, uh, to hide here. But as archaeologists, we know he did not come here for that. He cannot hide himself here because this is a bad, strategically, bad place to hide from an enemy. You know, it's, anyway, and Paranitan has also argued the, argued the same. But then these stories and some stories say that, you know, 500 queens hurled down from the hurled from from the from the rock. Kashyapa uh, killed himself or committed suicide at the battlefield. They jumped, and the, the poetry in the in the uh, those poetic inscriptions on the on the mirror wall also claims that. And. Uh, The stories that the people believe 
about uh, Sigiriya. The story is that the people of Sigiriya believe about Sigiriya is very different from, from our. But they sometimes they begin from Mahavansa and they have a different ending. They have different uh, uh, different uh, additions to Mahavansa story. But then, so then, then we have what we call okay, historical past of Sigiriya, an archaeological past for Sigiriya. Then a, this is what we call anthropological past or following um, this famous uh, and important historian, um, Hayden White, I would say a practical past. Why do we need such a practical past? Why do people at Sigiriya need such a, such a past for Sigiriya, not our past? This is an interesting, you know, I'm, I'm, even though Hashini said that I'm an archaeologist, I'm not, oh yeah, I'm an archaeologist, but I'm more into heritage management. When you say some site is not just archaeological, it is heritage, what you do is you, you, you are claiming, or you say that you would share the interpretation management authority endowed upon you by your position, or by your training, because you are a professor, because you are a director of archaeology. No, you do not hang on these, these authoritative labels, positions, but you share the authority of managing interpretation with the people. Because what is interesting is people of Sigiriya, they have no problem living with more than one history. It is these learned people who cannot live with uh, multiple histories, multiple stories. We want to zero down. And then, <clears throat> this is why a Sigiriya is a site of difference. It allows for these different stories to coexist. Um, Ashin, have I taken too much time? No, I think that was have perfect. Have I taken actually. too much time? A lot of time. No, 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 not at all. I, I have just one more thing. Yes, please, please. Uh, may I, can I, I want to. Okay. So, so why do we people, why do people need, okay, for some other people, but there's another story about, another story of uh, Sigiri is that, you know, for some people, this is, was uh, Ravana. This was Ravana's building, Ravana's palace. You know, it, in, um, in, 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 nine, in, in, uh, 1897 or something like that, when HCP Bell was doing excavation on the summit of the rock, he had to do, um, he excavated many places um, and then on the demand of the people of Sigiriya, he especially excavated uh, a smaller pond because the people of Sigiriya at that time, this is late 19th century, he records it in, 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 in his uh, as annual annual archaeological report that you know following the tradition of the natives they did this to find that they believe that there is a passage into the rock where all the treasures are hidden and then he said it's another depression on the rock and yes they all were very frustrated it is a point you know it went no further so he so this is a tradition that you know people believe that there is a treasure inside and then and those for those who believe that uh, Sigiriya is, uh, is, is, is Ravana, this is, these are not uh, lions, for these are the poles of a gurula, because they say there are only three you know, nails. So my, okay, my point is this. Why do we, why do we make all these, these things, this practical past? You know what? This, once again, I'll go hang on, uh, on, uh, on head and white. Hayden White claims that you know professional historians, when you are professionally trained, when you have a PhD in history and all that, you have, you think in a particular way about doing history. If you are a good historian, they you think that that they think that they can construct history objectively, neutralizing ideological distortions of the past, and you know so they can write with objectivity and uh, disinterest. What is, what is interesting is people, most people find this kind of history no use. And they create history, they, they add myths, stories. I tell you, so when you ask the villagers of Sigiriya, 
about and they know the kind of history that we have we unearth by doing archaeology and it is not the same thing that they believe that they don't they don't care what what we believe they hold on to their story because this is something that i found in the field because that is the only way that they can they can claim their their rights in these jungles into this area it is this story that they use to to resist undue development coming of five star hotels and you know in, in, uh, onslaught of of urban culture into the into this thing yeah. you cannot stop it but you know this is how they claim their authentic right to the site by their own history but not going on our history point two so i said you know i will i mean we can talk about this um, um quite a lot but i'll i come to tell you i want to bring to your attention why is igre is a site of difference you know it is a site of difference because it presented this a different idea of kingship in ancient sri lanka and on top of that igre has a unique social and cultural significance in modern sri lanka you know i you know i have all right now i'm going to be forgive me where in the world in where in sri lanka in how many places can a whole family look at women like this you know they are they are breasted you know? and where in in sri lanka people can bring in a historical authenticity to sensuousness we think you know we sri lankan you know that this is a very very late mid 20th century or 20th century post independent nationalist rhetoric mingled with victorian ethos that you know sri lanka is is a very kind of a, it's a no fun place like you know there was no sensuousness it was very you know pious and you know some discipline society no sri lankan sri lanka when you look at it at the sigiri and the mirror wall those sensuous poetic inscriptions for modern sri lankans sigiri brings an authentic historical weight to the idea of expressing love even when I, i remember when i was young expressing the idea of love for the first time i said in my mirror wall of my heart i have written your name or something like that i have inscribed your your love in on the on the mirror wall of my heart so the mirror wall become a, a, a marker of a sign of of uh, what uh, of a true love and 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 this quot and quot you know this seeming nudity became acceptable this sensuousness became uh, you know you know there is a popular i don't know how many of you will agree with me when we were in the universities you know and seeing that there was us not a very it's a very western thing but when you look at sigiri sigiri has pleasure gardens gardens made for pleasure not only sigiri even in anuradhapura but we we'll talk about sigiri and look at these women and so uh, the idea in the idea of sigri there lies a historical memory and a materially informed idealism that can be called upon by the modern subject to constructing and claiming historically authentic sensuous and romantic dispositions in modern sri lanka this is the difference of sigri i think hasini i would stop there yes i i think uh, questions have started coming in and i think it's very good to have at least half an hour we would like to wrap up in another 30 minutes by 7:30 uh, so let's open up for questions and there are already two questions that are uh, that have come in so i'm going to read that out um, so one is from uh, dinushka bandara uh, or dinushka bandara Uh, was sigiriya mentioned in the chula vansha or mahavansha before king kasyapa uh, 477 ce because of the buddhist monastic settlements were established during the 3rd century bc so why do sources mention sigiriya only after kasyapa so i think yeah yeah yeah, yeah this is what i mean. yeah that's a good question you know never uh, uh, question that it's very interesting no, no i don't think so i don't think so kashyap sigiri comes into the history the stage of history 
with Kashyapa. Yeah. And we, uh, we archaeologists have found most of the other stories, aspects of, of, of Sigiriya. Yeah. And the other question. Uh, yes, there are other questions. So there is one about uh, evidence found in Sigiriya that points to Mahasen's era. Uh, and the an, uh, attendee asks whether this is supposed to be an advanced period of Sri Lankan history technologically and whether uh, there is any evidence found in Sigiriya in Mahasen era. Not really, but those tanks can be no can be can be it's the, the history of these tanks can be traced back back to those times no and and yeah. and the other thing is but the other thing is archaeologists have not looked at that question as far as i understand but we we know we know sigiriya has a long history you see it's a uh, it's it <clears throat> You know, Sigri has lots of prehistoric sites at Potana, and the, uh, and Sigri has a number of uh, ancient metallurgy sites. Dr. Ross Solangarachi, my colleague, did important studies on these things. And what do these things mean? And, and Sigri is located in an archaeologically important ecological ecological niche, so to speak. Uh, Professor Sudarshan Senegratna has, uh, you know, very, very interestingly uh, painted this, this archaeological, uh, ecological importance of Sigiri and its area because it is the beginning of two major uh, river systems, river basins, which saw the uh, coming of development of Anuradhapura um, civilization, so to speak. So see, it is from here, you know, Yarn Noya and uh, and uh, what are the two hist two historical reviewers. So in order to answer that question, I have to to I would like to say these things. No? Sigiriya, the rock is an archaeologically important is in an archaeologically important area, known as the Sigiriya Dambula region, containing a plethora of cultural sites, expanding from the prehistoric to the colonial era. This region which borders the north central penny plain on its northern side and on and to its south like and to its south lies the hilly regions of the central mountains of the island the region that gives rise rise to all the major rivers of the country and historically important rivulets especially such as bellanoya mirisgonioya yarnoya all these oils goes through through sigiriya dambula region a branch of bellanoya feeds into the historically important malvatuoya that saw the rising of complex social systems in Anuradhapura since 3rd century BC on the lands that those rivers fertilized. No? Uh, <clears throat> the Yarnoya Basin that is home to numerous megalithic barriers goes to Pulmude. So it is from Sigiriya yeah, that this, this ma major water courses flows out. So could it be that why Kashyapa went there? Because Sigiriya is a strategically important area in terms of mineral resources, uh, water courses, and also minerals. So my, my response to that question is, archeologists have been looking in, the, in this area and they have found all these prehistoric and, and early historic um, archeological remains. But whether they have been, been to Mahasen, that I don't know. I just, it doesn't come to my head right now if they have done that. Mm -hmm. So there is a follow-up question to that, which is also about uh, evidence, um, uh, about um, follow-up to Dinushka's question earlier. Are there any archaeological evidence on the monastic settlements before oh, yeah. and king? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hold on. I think I had one small picture. Do that. No, there are some. I'm sorry, I have not put that. Yeah. Of course. So we have. You know, what is interesting is, you know, that's an interesting question. That looks like an archaeologist asking this question. What, how do we understand if we, if we did not have Mahavamsa, if we just had Sigiriya as a, as a site? Uh, this is a good, you know, so then the material, then we would say the material culture of Sigiriya that archaeologists have found is telling us a particular kind of story that, you know, 
a larger component of this archaeological inventory consists of remains of large scale brick buildings, wall staircases, the land staircases. And then if you go the vertical history in time and space, if you go down on, on, on this axis, yeah, you find uh, those caves with drip ledges with early uh, early Brahmi inscriptions that are donatory uh, inscriptions. So yeah, we have uh, good evidence for for monastic settlement before Kashyapa era and for after Kashyapa era. Yeah, I've seen it. So there are a few questions about uh, uh, elaborations. Uh, one is about pleasure gardens. Can you tell us a little bit more about the pleasure gardens? Yeah. Can I go to my screen? Same. Share screen. Is that okay? Uh, yes, you will have to share the screen again, I think. Yeah. Yeah. This way. That, so this is where we are looking at the pleasure gardens, what we call pleasure gardens or water gardens. This is the western face of the Sigiriya rock. So if you were in the Kashyapa time and if you were a royalty, you would, have, you would be entering, I would think, the uh, Kashyapa, Kashyapa's uh, world through this side, from this side, western entrance, right here, right here, you have what we call the triple entrance. Oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah, triple entrance. So you can, the king goes through the main axis and then his retinue takes the side entrance, so triple entrance. So you have this Charbag kind of pond, Charbag meet. This pond is made out of four ponds, making an island in the system. And this concept of Charbag that goes back to you know ancient times, goes back all the way to, to Iran, Pakistan, all these areas. And covered by these trees, there is a miniature water garden here. You know, I don't know. Uh, many people um, have wondered what, what what was the function of this miniature water garden? They are smaller in scale and, and not much, maybe about a couple of inches. So people believe they were supposed to enjoy it in, in the moonlight. Like anyway, so these four water uh, this big ponds, and, and and as you go through, you come to this uh, running water, the water fountain area, and on either side of the water, on on this side, on this here and here, you have what we call the summer garden. It's once again, you cannot see it here. You see these trees. There is a small island created by a, uh, by, by a moat. So it is it's called the summer gardens, summer, summer palaces or whatever of Kashyapa. And then for the wrap, then you come to what we call the terrace garden. Here you come to the, what we call the boulder gardens. What is interesting about planning dynamics here is, here you have a very geometrically organized space. That means the designers have imposed their, pla their plan onto the nature. That's what you experience at the beginning. See, it is, everything is decided by the eye of the designer. Strong axis, very controlled, very disciplined. So you enter, you know, you have been, and then you go on and it goes on terraces, a couple of levels. And here you can enter a very totally the opposite of planning, planning dynamics. That is everything is decided by boulders in, in this area. So it is a mere, it goes like this, it turns like that and this. So the way you walk, the, the designing of the path was decided by the location of those boulders. And remember, these boulders did, did not look like boulders during Kashyapa's time because most of these boulders, we have, if you go there next time, look carefully, look very well, they have been plastered. 
their natural rockness must have been have been changed into maybe they would have looked like big clouds white clouds and on them you have small buildings just imagine wonderful put your imagining cap and think about it here you go very geometric very ordered gradually this orderedness loses its this command on you and you're being absorbed into a boulder garden where it is organically designed you walk through and then you walk up gradually and you see these white boulders with probably decorated beautiful uh, building on them on here and in this covered underneath this tree here you have this kashyapas but they actually is called the audience hall and there is a ritual bath uh, bath there where the king would have taken a ritual bath and the, that water that cleansed him that bathed him would have come down and gone into another cave and then he would have come to the audience hall to receive this minister so whatever so what i am telling you is here it is the nature has decided more here it is the human eye the designer's authority and then you enter take steps and you enter the pathway to the corridors that will take you around this thing to the lion terrace and the lion staircase that will take will allow you to if you are allowed to go go to the summit of the rock so this is the basic plan of the water gardens of kashyapa it is it begins with a particular logic and then goes to its opposite and then it mix both those logic of planning mechanism right here dr dilan kure had done his phd on this aspect of planning and designing aspects of of sigri it's freely available in the in the net you should uh, if you are really interested download it and read it that's my so, answer so jagat yeah so jagat we have over 18 questions so i am going to try and uh, uh, ask you to uh, keep Uh, explanations also short so that we can go uh, faster on them and uh, oh, yeah. i'm Hope getting a lot to... of questions about yeah i'm getting a lot of questions about uh, details but i would like to change the direction slightly because this is also about teaching history so there's an interesting question uh, from uh, Mario Gomes does the current pedagogy of history teaching allow for the teaching of multiple histories if not how does one change it uh, because it was very interesting the way you presented all the different stories you know no you know what in 1966 dr raja de silva his P oxford phd was on the materials and techniques of painting techniques of, of sri lanka so right he has convincingly proved that the sigri murals are not frescoes they are murals they are they are painted on dry plaster using a plant gum but e even today i think the department of education and its syllabus have not even taken that that bit of information into the syllabus even today students are taught that the sigri are frescoes so you are talking about multiple histories being taught no not in the schools even in the university well at the at my institute the postgraduate institute of archaeology when we teach critical history to our master students we teach this and also we at the postgraduate diploma we have a unit called ways of narrating the past we we use this but i don't know how it's happening in the i don't think this ganatha obesekaras this this essay this wonderful research is discussed in the classroom at all no because so, yes yeah. there's there's something that goes in the similar direction uh, mm -hmm. raised by john rogers so i'm just going to read it out to you uh, one is a compliment to you jagat i love how you delineate and accommodate the multiple stories of sigiria very nicely done the question is when you accommodate these multiple stories how do they change your interpretation of the various features at sigiria such as the paintings or pleasure gardens so i think it's a very uh, similar question to one raised by uh, mario so you can follow up on it um should i should i read read the question no, again no no I, it's a tough question yes. i tell you what you see <laughs> it 
it does not press by into uh, the apsaras. I tell you so. So these apsaras have been personified, made into real women in this poetry, and that idea is also among the villagers. One of the uh, uh, inscriptions blame Kashyap for abandoning her, or whatever, and and then about the this hurling of these queens or, or the ladies from the, the, the rock. What I while these multiple histories do not we accommodating these ideas along with what we uh, with okay the, okay my interpretation okay my my allegiance is towards that these apsaras the function of these apsaras they are not vijulata or meglata but they bring a particular narrative specificity to the to this area which is a celestial it's bringing a certain notion of certain dimension of celestiality to the ambience of of this place and so these people who enter this site is being uh, uh, are given Kashyapa's politics from the very beginning so i call them the apsaras of political promise so going to john's question not really but but it bring in certain certain dimensions certain uh, certain di dimension to our interpretation so that they get more 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 acceptance within the entire network of meanings i know i don't know how to answer that question john <laughs> um no, it doesn't change, to be honest, not much. But it does change these multiple histories, the way I present the site. It does change the way I, I organized my heritage management approaches to the site. For example, we are establishing something called Uruma Sabha in, in Sigiri, or the heritage committees in each village. And members of these villages will come in to form a heritage cooperative. And that will come into power, my heritage management uh, my site meetings. So I do that because I share, uh, I, I, am, I am committed to the manage, share management of interpretation with them. So that is how it changes. But you see, I will always be an archaeologist or, or someone, you know, a historian who tries to be very objective and scientific. Yeah. So, uh, Jagat, uh, I remember I shared with you in advance, uh, there was a question that came on the email, even before you made the presentation uh, yeah. from Mr. Lakshan Daya. So I think we should address that uh, yeah. about the Christian influences of Mughalan in, and Christianity in Sigre times. So the question is, can you elaborate more on Professor Parnavitana's opinion on Kerala and Christian influences in Mughalan and yeah. Christianity yeah. in Sigre times? Well, you see, it's, it's, it's an important, it's, it's an interesting question at this point, you know, it's, it's an, it, you see, like, Story of Sigiri, that is the book, 1972, that he comes out with this really, quote, unquote, crazy story of Sigiri, of Mughalan, of, of some Brahmin called, I think, Mana or Maga, and, and this, you know, this Christian influence and Kerala thing and all that. He gets this story from, um, uh, some recording, some narratives of, of us, Ananda Stavir or somebody, and especially based on interlinear reading. What has happened is within the archaeologist community of archaeologists and historians, these things that Paranitana constructed at its very advanced age is not seriously considered anymore. When it, if you read that Prabhu Mihindu Kula Surya's essay, survey kind of essay on the Christian and um, Persian Christian of the Anuradhapura period, you know, you can, you know, what you can see, the presence of, of, of um, Christian uh, ideas in the ancient Sri Lanka 
cannot be questioned as such. It is quite possible. And especially the Sassanian network, because in the, in the Mount of Sigiriya, we find Sassanian ceramics. And in the, most of these excavations, we have, we have come across so many Sassanian um, uh, ceramics. So, so if the, if Sig oh, interesting things like, you know, Sigiri is, is the, the only place where you get this blue color called lapis lazuli. The, the non-historical deposit was uh, above Afghanistan. It's called Badakhshan. So how did that those, those materials come here? Sigiriya was part of this very active trade network at that time. So Sigiriya helped to be, it must have been very wealthy to afford uh, that, that precious blue color. It is from there that that blue color, it is said that it went to Rome, that beautiful lapis lazuli, you know, this pigment. So the possibility of, of, of having a possibility of, of the presence of, presence of, of, of Christian ideas and thoughts of that time is quite possible because we have a material culture that shows of a possible network, trade network. Along with that, because you cannot say, you know, with the Silk Road and all these trade networks, it's only just one idea and all these ideas come in. So that is what I have to say. I take it as another story of Sigiriya. And, but I was not taught about this, this part of Sigiriya. This, this Paranitana's later writings were not considered, um, not discussed in, in the classroom. So, and uh, yeah, that's what I have to say. Uh, speaking from the archaeological record, yeah, these ideas could have come easily. These, but I particularly cannot speak about this particular book, uh, Story of Sigiri, because I have not closely studied it, only, you know, read the story of it. I'm sorry about that. I, I did, you know, this is Jagat, how it is have... like, you know, yeah. Yeah, Jagat, we have uh, two interesting questions that go in a slightly different direction. Uh, one is about tourism. Um, so um, this is raised by Kamarika Jayatilaka. Uh, she is asking, how would you comment on the stories that combine to represent Sigiriya within the contours of contemporary tourism? Would you say the Western concepts such as romanticism or exoticism play a part particularly in terms of the images of Sigiriya that are circulated with tourism. And then there is a follow-up question, which I will also pose now, about the distribution of funds across archaeological sites in Sri Lanka. Um, your, your mic went uh, mute. All your mic is muted. No, okay. So let's Something take the first question mind. on contemporary tourism. Yeah, and then we will. Go yeah, you see, this. like, you know, for most contemporary tourists, they're coming, they are seeing this as, as most, like for some, to some I have spoken to you, or, or according to our tour guides, you know, they see it as an, the eighth wonder of the world kind of thing. And it's very, you know, like the tourism management of tourist is handled by, in, with a, by a particular system. So they are not open to all these stories. Now we have changed the way that people buy their ticket. We have made them to go through the museum or uh, through the uh, museum building. So most tourists, they come with a very tight schedule and they don't spend time uh, here. And our, our, our museum also do not tell all these stories of Sigiriya. So we are planning to redo the, uh, redesign the Sigiri Museum as well. So my, my, my response to that question is, most tourists do not get these multiple histories of Sigiri. And what they get is the Mahamsa story of Sigiri in a nutshell. And I don't think they even deal with the this this interesting dynamics of the of the water garden. What they are most interested in is looking at the 
the first course for the CEO. And uh, so, you asked me about the funds. Yes, uh, there's a, the question is, uh, this is by Anina Madhivanan. Uh, I have the feeling mm -hmm. that a lot of money has been invested in archeological work in Seagiria so far. How do you assess the distribution of funds for archaeological work in Sri Lanka? And how do you feel about your work as an archaeologist in Sri Lanka? It's slightly out of the topic, but still it's a very interesting question. So I thought I'll take it up. No, no, I see. Seagiria is a major moneymaker. Like, you know, I think 80% of, of uh, money of, of cultural, uh, central cultural fund is coming from Sigiriya. You know, on most, on, on, on busy days, we will have an unbroken line of people. Just really trust me. This is, I'm not lying. I'm not exaggerating. There's an unbroken line of people from all the way from the top, here, 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 up to here. No, not exaggerating. This is, you know, in busy days, like, you know, the peak tourism, tourism, uh, tourism, periods like you know, October, November, those anyway, <coughs> money um, from the, right now yeah. we don't like, you know, with the COVID thing, we don't have, but we usually have enough money, but what is, you know, well, this is the typical problem. We spend more money, not for real archaeological work, but to pay salaries. Because we are more sometimes, you know, in certain categories, we are overstaffed. You know, different politicians use, well, the same story. They put people and, yeah, we spend so much money for paying salaries. And we spend less money for doing real archaeology. Well, so, I, since we are, yeah, I can say that. Yeah. So since we are on the topic uh, a little bit on the politics of things, there's another anonymous question raised. Do you think the mm. multiplicity of historical narratives of a place open up history, political agendas and political manipulation in the present? Or do you think the opposite is true? That the adherence to one rigid historical truth can lead to the political manipulation of history for political purposes. So this is again about uh, different perspectives and how to juggle them. You know, this every day you know, these are very difficult, difficult questions, but, but the whole point is, you see, like, I tell you what, thing. the real problem in Sri Lanka, I'll come to, I'll answer and try to respond to that as much as possible, real problem, that those people who believe in, believe in practical past, they want to claim it, it's the same status as of historical past, because, you see, my father used to, to believe in certain things about the past, like the Ravana and, and all that. But for them, the historical past was, okay, was also there. It's like the villages of Sigiri. I mean, they have no problem with our history. And they don't give us, they don't, they don't, they don't care about what we believe about Sigiri. This is what I like them so much, but I respect them so much. They, we can live with multiple histories. It is us, the urban, urban, uh, urban people who can live with multiple histories. Anyway, so having multiple histories is an inevitable, whether we like or not, there will always be more than one history. But historical narrative of, uh, uh, more than one narrative of an historical event. And letting them be will allow for, for, allow for people to join with, link with an archaeological entity in different ways. You know, this is why I might find myself fascinated at Sigiria is, Sigiria is so many things at the same time. So political manipulation of, of the past, yeah, that is, you know, for example, you know how, for example, you know, this whole different ideas concepts like, you know, the Nijabim, the original land, all these are, you know, you know, problematic history um, concept and it uh, comes, if you try to understand the Nijabim or the original homeland of a particular ethnic group or Sinhalese or whatever, you see, when you 
critically engaged with this thing, they cannot go too far. I mean, they, they are meaningless, like, you know. So, but it is, their meaninglessness can be experienced by letting these multiple histories exist. And that I think by preserving multiple histories, you can always control and resist manipulative and interventions into the system. Like the, as I was trying to say at, my, at one point in my presentation, like, you know, why do these people hang on to their history? Because, you know, I have, I have written about this idea. Let's, let's look at this, give me a minute. This is interesting. Before Jonathan Forbes going to Sigiriya, Sigiriya was still there, no? And there were villages, there were people, there were temples and all that. The moment Jonathan Forbes, Forbes went there, he was followed by other adventurous explorers. What did they do? What they gave rise to something called the people at Sigiriya became natives first, according to them. They get support from the natives of Sigiriya. There were people in Sigiri all of a sudden, with this arrival of these people, they become natives. And they become, the moment the inhabitants of Sigiri become natives in Sigiri, because there are these visiting others with privileges coming to Sigiri. And then they help these privileged people to climb Sigiri, go above Sigiri. And then, okay, the explorers, the adventurous people, then the explorers, then comes scholars and artists. Then it becomes Sigiriya, we begin to look at Sigiriya from a very different angle. And these people are forever stuck in this frame of being natives because they are beneficiaries of this system that archaeology and history has created around Sigiriya. See, my work and my insistence and my engagement with these people and preserving the multiple histories and endow and giving them a position to manage interpretation management of the site in terms of its presentation and other things is to take them out of this idea of being natives, but being of, of inhabitants of the place again. I may be confused. Thing. I may be confusing you, but my point is this. How okay, multiple histories are here, and I want um, to share the, the interpretation management protocols with the, with the villagers because of these multiple histories. And it is by doing that you can preserve the site against various kinds of interventions. So Jagat, at this point, I'm going to make an announcement to attendees that we might go on for another 15 minutes. Uh, we were supposed to close the session at 7.30, but we have a lot of very interesting questions. So I assume that we can go on a little bit longer um, and we will try as much as possible to answer some of the questions that are raised. So now I want to throw at you a, a question that is from Facebook, which might confuse us a little bit more even, but still uh, a rather broad question is what is heritage management? How does contemporary politics influence such endeavors? Is there a code of ethics or some governance structure uh, that for heritage management? You see, okay. If I, I I didn't hear the question because your mic is uh, your mic is mute. Uh, you see, heritage management say that in a nutshell is okay, there are certain things that we identify as heritage. What that means is we believe that you know these things have the potential, or they have by being in a particular place or in a particular time, they can carry and preserve collective memories, collective associations from the past and from the present in them. And so heritage management is managing all these associations. 
early on it could be from a perspective of the heritage specialist people me but now we begin heritage managing is people like us become the facilitators of these associations facilitators of preserving these associations with the entity that we recognize or identify as as heritage the ethics of heritage there's plenty you know and uh, one first fundamental ethic is which is very uh, difficult it will sometimes people well yeah you see heritage does not belong to to archaeologists or to historians a heritage belongs first we know we have world heritage and all that first this is my conviction and i would argue for that i understand it belongs to the associated communities first it's not about its universal heritage outstanding universal values as what what makes sigiri is a world heritage because of its outstanding universal values good very good but sigiri has to be preserved not only to preserve those outstanding universal values that has made it a world heritage but those and the association that it has with it so you cannot preserve heritage one fundamental ethic is without the participation of the community in heritage management uh, procedures and processes that is one of the fundamental ethics but not everyone is comfortable with that you know people like me my colleague gamini vijasurya dr nilan kure there are few people who are very you know promoting this idea uh, heritage management as a uh, it's a community thing and secondly you see i told you like you know uh, how i practice how, how i convert this this my my what i believe into practice like you know making heritage community heritage uh, uruma sabha or heritage committees and a heritage cooperative and identifying uh, especially uh, the people who preserve traditional knowledge system you see sigiri is not just this rock Sigiriya, the idea of Sigiri encompasses a lot more: the tanks, the forest, the the the, the animals, the birds, the trees, um, you know, all that. You know, the the livelihood and you know, all that is Sigiri. Sigiri is archaeological only for us. For me, like you know, if you are not preserving all that and sharing. <clears throat> uh, sharing the the idea of sigiri with the people is is it is the is is also a fundamental ethic in heritage management at the same for amradapura you know to take dambulla and take you know but sigiri is unique because it's not a religious site and um, it's yeah. it's, it's, so, it's it, yeah yeah so there's another interesting question on methodology which i would like to throw to you um so the question is raised by isuru kumar singha uh, what methodology do you suggest for interdisciplinary collaboration between fields of art and human sciences with regard to conservation uh, and what role uh, of the artist uh, what role can the artist play in the evaluation and remaking of history so he's referring to the uh, you know the colonial and anti nationalist perspectives and you know construction of history and historiography will i try to uh, hmm. make the question brief yes you see like uh, now we do believe do understand i'm like we have to understand we have to do our heritage managing a site like heritage is not the soul uh, not within this uh, restricted area of archaeology or art history you know this is why you know heritage management it, it becomes a management problem because there are so many people associate with this site with different different interests so managing all these interests is is cannot be restricted to a pigeon hole to one discipline see managing sigiriya in my case i you know we work with the tourist department we work with the uh, the pradeshya sabhas we work 
work with the uh, all these people who are selling souvenirs uh, what we call the low end artist graphic designers you know there is a lot of you know huge commanding system a system of directing people here and there and, you know garbage uh, garbage management there are oh, running a heritage management site is a collaborative project necessarily it is not cannot be restricted to one discipline at all and on the other level like if we take what garanath obesekar professor garanath obesekar study is it while i am fascinated by paranitanas the archaeologist uh, and seraka bandaranayaka's work you know are finding from doing archaeology and digging deep into its vertical and horizontal histories these are fascinating findings we definitely know that kashyap was not hiding here you know we definitely know that kashyap did not lose his authority of 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 uh, can i say manipulating resources or collecting resources collecting human labor collecting you know all that you know it, this was you know it was it, it was linked to our international trade network we <coughs> that's a wonderful story at the same time what the people who are living next door to sigiri are thinking about sigiri you know it is equal yet fascinating story so anthropologist you need um then you have you know yeah it's a, it's, it's a collaborative um, management Uh, and uh, researching system yeah yeah so uh, jagat there's another interesting question yeah i mean there's another interesting question about the linearity of our narratives uh, this is raised by travis gomes um, he is asking you mentioned mm. that in the post kasapa period it was a site of pilgrimage mm. and tourism and then used as a military outpost during the kandian kingdom was sigiriya always in the popular imagination or was it forgotten before it was rediscovered and yeah, yeah. excavated in the 19th century yes yeah yeah I it was think... forgotten mm -hmm. popular, popular memory but you see you see hasini there's a mm -hmm. should we be thinking it like that from exactly. whose memory did it go you know uh, when jonathan uh, when jonathan forbes he reports that people knew about the pengurals he they knew about the staircase it uh, it, uh, it 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 uh, it 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 never disappeared vanished from the minds of the people around it but then what happened was what happened in the 19th century was it it in into the lang the english language discussions you know entering something to the language of english in the 19th century is a major thing no it gets printed and you know it is okay it was printed sigiri enters the language of the master so to speak so that it becomes something seriously important so this is what happened in uh, with jonathan forbes and the other people so it i i am very reluctant to use the word rediscover your discovery and what, what did i answer the question i'm very bad with these questions and now uh, i i think you did i think, did. I I think for me yes i i think you did i think it was about the linearity and you you really answered that so jaga uh, we we answered about 17 questions we also have 13 more open uh, unfortunately we won't be able to address all of them uh, because uh, we should finish uh, later by 7:00 i mean we've already extended by 15 minutes so what we can try to do is also to see if we can answer some of these questions through emails to you or to get in touch with jagat uh, Uh, is that okay jagat maybe they can get in touch with you personally if they really want to uh, uh, ask further yeah. details no, because uh, uh, shamin since we are here yeah. shamin mission or shamin hasini since we are here yeah. tell me yeah. um, tell me uh, what is the, are there any unique questions there 
So there are lots of questions about details, like, uh, for instance, the damage of the frescoes uh, that was oh, done. Yes. Uh, there's a lot about the motives of uh, flower, flowers, etc. Then there is a one on, please explain the link between uh, the place with King Mahasena. Um, uh, to name a few. And then there's one question to asking for an elaboration of Raja de Silva's interpretation. And also other, other sites uh, which are of uh, sensuous heritage, because you were at least, uh, referring to Sigiri as sensuous. So, um, yeah, there are quite a lot. I don't know which one you would like I tell to you what, pick up. No, I tell you what I cannot deal with right now is mm -hmm. this, uh, I'm sorry, no, you know, the, yeah. the Mahasen thing. I have to you know, really look into it. And Dr. Silva's uh, thesis that these are uh, Taras, you know, yes, yes, I have it in my, in my library, you know, it's a big book, but I'm not convinced about it personally. And also Dr. Uh, Professor Bandarnaika, if you look into this book, it's called, it's, it's a felicitation volume called Abhinandana Mala for Nandana Chutivans. Yes, Enakha Bandarnaika writes this, the lion mountain and the palace in the sky, notes on the identity of the royal complex at Chigiriya. He, he gives a very comprehensive response to that, which is, uh, which I, uh, I, which I, well, you see, yeah, which is more convincing than, because you see, one fundamental argument is this, is this, that, the, the Sigiri of Apsaras shows gestures that is similar to the ones find, uh, found with uh, Tara figures. Point one, one of his major arguments. And on the uh, top of the rock, he claimed that uh, Bell says that, uh, that he, in the Bell's inventory of findings that there are no tiles. So he says there were no palace. It was a Sakman Malu, a walking, uh, walking pathways only. It was not a palace. Uh, something, the, but those are not the archaeologically convincing arguments. One thing is, as I argued before, what these ladies are doing is it is bringing a particular specific, uh, what I call narrative specificity it, it, of being celestial, you know, so that. It fits with the idea of Kashyapa's politics, so to speak. And to do that, you actually bring in gestures from the religious art into this. This is this was my this is how I would think about it. But if uh, you know, but Dr. Silva's uh, has as you know has gone into length in explaining his argument about the. <clears throat> about the restoration of this, you know, in 1960s, these were vandalized by, but whoever vandalized this thing was did vandalize it, uh, it with, with ta, with, with, with uh, bitumen, no, bitumen. And what was important, what is significant about bitumen was bitumen did not react with the pigment. Because in Sigiriya, Dr. Silva has, uh, in his thesis has shown us that the Sigiriya artist used what we call uh, earth pigments or inorganic, I think, yeah, inorganic pigments. For example, that green is terra verde. It's, it's a mineral pigment. And the red is uh, red, red ochre. And uh, yellow is yellow ochre. So these are all mineral pigments. And it is also true, the paint receiving layer of Sigiria is made of, of lime, not just lime, not any lime, but lime made with seashells. But you might, might wonder why, you know, in Sigiri there uh, are so many limestones, but the Sigiri artist did not use lime made from limestone. They used lime made from content of uh, uh, lime, uh, magnesium content of lime made from seashells is less. So it is much finer. Its workability is high. So but this is because of this that they thought you know these are fresco but they were also these pigments were mixed with a plant gum many people think it is divula or the sap of the wood apple tree but 
scientifically you know it is buddha pearl or whatever you cannot say that but you know it is it, uh, you know it has he found a lot of uh, i think a lot of sugars in in this medium so it is a plant gum so if it is fresco you sh- you wouldn't use a plant gum no fresco you should do when you do something fresco you believe your pigments mixed with water on the wet plaster and when plaster dries calcium hydroxide turns into calcium carbonate making a hard surface with the pigment the sigiria artist did not either they did not know it or they did not trust on believe on this fresco reaction that is why they had used according to dr silva they had used the mm, plant gum but there is also another aspect maybe it is a sampling problem no? because if you have taken two samples ten samples only from detailed areas maybe the details were done in in in, in this what we call the secco technique not fresco the rest is done in fresco but nobody has done, really studied these aspects right now we so, from yeah Yeah. yeah so jagat i'm just going to interject no that i it's it's very interesting and engaging session and i am very sad to cut it short but i'm trying to come up with a solution of addressing all the questions we have and i've actually found it so what we will do is we've saved all the questions that i have come in and we can sort of do a small q and a and update it on our facebook page Uh, so that people who uh, are really keen could see some of the answers that's one option we could also get in touch uh, with those who have left their names with the questions uh, privately but what we could actually do is to take the remaining questions and try to do a small uh, q&a sheet and update it along with the posting on our facebook page international center for ethnic studies sri lanka so i think that's uh, a good uh, way of managing it wouldn't you say so jagat right yeah 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 okay so let's uh, let's try to do that then so i really have to thank for all the participants who stayed with us for this extra time as well and thank you for such enthusiasm and engagement and raising very interesting questions even they did put jagat a little bit in trouble at times i think that's the spirit of the whole uh, uh, thing i very much enjoyed moderating this session 